Good afternoon. We're going to get started. This is our, our last meeting for Michigan time. No, no laughter there. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, so uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Becky O'Brien. I'm the chair of the RAC Communications Subcommittee. And um, this uh, meeting is put on by the RAC Communications Subcommittee members. We're a whole group. So if the other committee members might stand up for a quick second, just so people can see who you are. Thank you. I get to stand up here, but they're really the ones that make it happen. Um, we also wanted to recognize any newcomers. Is there anyone that this is your first meeting? You might stand up so we could say welcome. Nobody, everybody's a little too afraid. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, and we also just wanted to remind people, so we've got remote attendees, hello. Um, so this is webcast as well as recorded. So people who you know, have deadlines or something and can't make it quite here, they're able to still join us. Um, I wanted to do a few little housekeeping items. So on your table, you'll notice there's a place to sign your name, sign in so we know who's here. Um, and wear your name tag so people at your table or during the networking section, uh, people know who you are. Um, and then we wanted to just do a little follow-up. We asked last October at the last meeting, we did a survey just to get a little bit of feedback about how these meetings are going. And um, thank you for all of you who responded. Um, we will be continuing to do that. We're going to, you know, give some feedback, find out, you know, let you guys know what we're hearing. We're going to gather a little bit of data before we do that. So um, we'd really appreciate after this meeting, we'll also send out another uh, survey about this specific meeting. So please. Um, give us your feedback. We'd really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our MC for today, Kathy DeWitt, who probably many of you have met her or heard her name. She is the, um, I'm going to get the title right, uh, Managing Project Rep Representative on the government team in uh, ORSP. And we'd like to invite Kathy up. Okay, so many people know I'm loud. <laughs> so I really don't feel like I need the mic. But I will do it. I want to say hi to all the people out there in TV land. I want to thank all the people who got their proposals that were due today to me before I came down here so I could get them submitted. So clasp, big round of applause to that department. And I'm sorry you guys are still overworked and underpaid and couldn't be here. Uh, I thought about this and everybody has come to me when they ask me about emceeing and said, do you do jokes? Because everybody does jokes. Craig does jokes. Brian does jokes. I don't do jokes. I'm not a joke person. And then we sat and had our meeting on Monday. I think it was Monday, it seems like it was just yesterday, but they said they wanted to see me in a different light. So I thought about that, and I thought, mm, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? And then I thought, well, I could come up with a flashlight and shine a blue light on me, and then a red light, then a yellow light, and ask the opinion of the crowd of whether I looked better in blue, yellow, green, red. But I thought instead, and then Constance had the idea of Christmas lights, <laughs> but we decided the color clashed with what I was wearing today. So I thought I'd just give some trivia about me that you all might not know. I'm the eldest of six kids. I have five kids. I've been at the university for 30 years, and during that 30 years, two of my, well, yeah, two of my kids were born during that time. So I have children ranging from 42 to 21. I'm insane, but I manage my chaos very well, hence I can work in the office. When I retire, and I do think about it more and more, Craig, <laughs> I want to come back and be a park ranger because those that know me know I love going to the national parks and through my journeys 
in traveling with my family and camping, an SRA. I've managed to see a lot of great parks in this country. I want to thank all the research administrators here because you make me look so good. You do. Without you, I wouldn't be where I am today. So thanks for that. And without further ado, I'm going to start with our program. And we're going to meet people from different offices today. And some of these offices you may never deal with. Some of these offices you may deal with on a regular basis. So our first person to come up today is Alex Weibar. He's from the Human Incentive Services Program? Human Subject Incentive Human Incentive Subjects. Program. Oh, see, I, you can tell I didn't ever have to deal with human subjects. So thank you, Alex. Thank you. Hello, thank you guys for having me here. Um, briefly kind of go over a, a very high level overview of uh, what we do with the Human Subject Incentive Program, um, who we are, how you can contact us, um, and there we are. So HCIP, is, we run a very lean operation. It's me and two program assistants. Um, that is uh, Stacy Turrell and Tasha Patipoff. Um, what we do is again, very high level, is we, we help facilitate the payments of incentive payment, uh, the, the payment of incentives to human subjects in, in research studies. Um, what else does that mean? We handle all the documentation of those, we help you get the funds, um, help you, uh, you know, maybe determine what, what's the best thing for, for, for the study, um, kind of moving on, how we, how we direct, directly relate to the research admin, administration enterprise is working directly with the study teams, again, to, to get those payments out, to get the documentation for it, um, to help them maybe determine what is the best payment method, um, help track payments if, if their participants have questions on either where their payment is, things like this. Um, also working with uh, a number of stakeholders within the university that includes the IRBs to make sure that, um, you know, that we're, we're getting the information that we're supposed to, we're keeping that confidential. Um, which I can segue that into, uh, we, we focus on what we call the three C's, and that's customer service, that's being there for, for, the study, for our study teams, for our other stakeholders across the university, um, doing whatever we can to assist. Second C is um, confidentiality. What we're getting is obviously gonna be sensitive data. We're gonna be getting names, addresses, SSNs, as these are taxable, uh, it is taxable income the incentive payments are, um, and confidentiality. Did I just say that? I said confidentiality. Compliance is the other. So again, remaining compliant with, uh, with, the, with not only university guidelines, but also IRS requirements. So with all that we do, um, uh, the, the common, common issues or, or, or pitfalls as, as listed here that we'll see are a, a, lot, of, a lot of it revolves around the, the uh, receipt documentation that we get from our study teams. Do we get the right information? If, if we needed a social security number, did we get that? Is it legible? Um, a lot of it, you know, fa fairly straightforward and simple things, but it's the, the things that we see a lot in that, um, the, 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 you know, things that we're gonna be reaching out to our customers uh, most commonly on. Um, so that said, other thing I, I definitely wanna mention that we do, we do offer training. We offer in-person training for, for our customers. We offer, um, excuse me, in-person on-site training. We also offer training at our office. We're located um, over at Wolverine Tower. For those that are gonna be using HSIP who may not be familiar with it, we highly recommend it just because it helps you kind of get familiar with it, get familiar with what may be needed, um, and get familiar with, with uh, me and my team for when you do have, have any questions. So how do you contact us? Um, we have a, a great email list that's just subject-incentives at UMICH. That goes to the entire HSIP team, so any questions that people have, we always recommend reaching out um, to that email group. Um, we also have a website which has a lot of great information on there in terms of you know, how you make payments, um, answers to lots of questions. Um, and then we're, we're always available, so you know, we're, we're always happy to you know, take your calls, take your emails, um, and we are happy to help. Keep it short. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alex. 
run up here again. Uh, our next guest is Bryce Piltz, who comes from OTT. He's the Director of Licensing. Take it away. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, everyone. So I see Carmen from my office. Maybe there's a few others. Carmen, we talked about this in advance. You're going to do an interpretive dance while I talk, right? <laughs> oh, okay, you were change, change of plans. We had practiced it. It was going to be really good, but we'll go ahead. So hi, everyone. I'm Bryce Pills. I'm Director of Licensing with the Tech Transfer Office. So what we do is we try to take intellectual property that's created by University of Michigan researchers and hand it off to a partner in industry so that they can turn that intellectual property into a product or service that can help the world. So at a great place like Michigan, we're fortunate because we have all sorts of cool inventions from software to potential cures for cancer. Just this past week, we worked with one of our recent licensees, which was a local startup, May Mobility, trying to commercialize autonomous vehicle technology that will make fleets of autonomous vehicles that can move us around campuses and take us to and from work. Um, we have lots of therapeutics that are potentially curing awful diseases. We work with really early stage innovation. So when an invention comes to us, it's a successful science experiment. And there needs to be a lot of work done, both by us and others at the University of Michigan, and then by a company on the outside to actually turn this into a product or service. So just for example, there was a lot of press a few years ago when the University of Michigan has first ever FDA-approved pharmaceutical product. And it's a drug called Serdalga, which is sold by Genzyme, and it's a treatment for Gaucher's disease. That invention um, was invented back in 1998 by Dr. Jim Shaman and his partner, uh, Norm Radin. We licensed it to Genzyme in 2000. It wasn't until, until 2014 where the FDA approved it, and at that time we started to see money come back into the University of Michigan. So it's a very long process. So how we work with research administration is you know, basically with everything we do. So we're dealing with the output of all the great research that's done here at the University of Michigan. When an invention comes to us, one of the first things we have to figure out is, are there any funding agreements tied to that, that invention that we need to figure out how to comply with? So if the invention was funded by industry-sponsored research, we need to track down in that agreement and figure out what are the rights that J&J &J or Ford have in this, and can we still commercialize this invention and comply with those rights? If it's a federally funded invention, and about 70% of the inventions that come to our office have federal funding, um, we need to um, comply with um, pretty extensive um, reporting requirements to those federal agencies. As you can imagine, the current political climate, it's more and more important for NIH and NSF and DOD to be able to show to their constituents how the, the funding that's going into academic labs is being used. So it's important for us that if an invention comes to us, it was funded by NIH, that we can then report back to NIH and say, hey, that, that money has been put to good use, it's now a drug that's on the market, and here's all the things that happened with us. And for that, we're working extensively with the PIs, the grad students, and, and the people in this room to help to track that down. As you might imagine, some faculty members that invent something aren't always certain about the money they used behind it. I know, surprise, surprise, and so often it's a team effort to try to track that down. Uh, a few other challenges we deal with are, you know, agreements come to us to handle, and they're not always a clear license agreement. So we're often working with Craig's group, procurement group, other groups around campus to figure out what's the right group to handle that agreement. You know, we, we handle material transfer agreements, but often an agreement comes to us, it's called a material transfer agreement, it's really a research agreement, it's really a procurement contract. So again, it's often a team effort where we know great people in other offices to work with them and figure out how can we tag team some of these agreements to make sure they're handled the right way. I also I already mentioned the, the compliance agreements. So that's generally what we do. I'll be over there afterwards if you want to hear more about tech transfer or figure out how we can work together. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Bryce. And our last office this morning, or this afternoon, boy, my, how time flies. Uh, I have Amanda Heff from Procurement who's going to talk about small business plans. Hi, 
everyone. Thanks, Kathy. Um, again, my name is Amanda. I'm from Procurement Services, and I'm here today with Linda Lyle. And we're going to talk, or I'm going to talk about small business plans. So we are the Procurement Solutions team. We are made up of four individuals, um, and we help administer the small business plans um, for any of um, the required the contracts that require a small business plan over seven hundred thousand uh, dollars, among various other responsibilities within procurement. You might know us a little better by our phone number four eight two one two option two. If anybody's familiar. Um, our team, myself being the primary contact, we assist the PIs and the RAs uh, to create the small business plans for you upon your request. And how do we relate to the research administration? Um, as I said before, we create the small business plans, but we also help to ensure that your subcontracting goals are being met. Uh, we do this, uh, there's a, there are a couple ways we can do this. Um, we reach out to the PIs and the RAs with our quarterly reports um, where you can review the spend that is going on with your project to see if your goals are being met. Uh, we also can help by identifying potential suppliers should you have a need uh, to meet one of those small business goals. Um, it's important to keep in mind too that um, when you're not meeting your goals, when the, when the project is not meeting spend goals, um, or showing that they're making a good faith effort in meeting those goals, it can possibly affect any future funding for future projects. So some of the common issues that we see um, within procurement with regard to the small business plans, um, we ask for two weeks notice to create a small business plan. Oftentimes we are asked for 48 hours or less of a turnaround time. And we understand that there are exceptions to this across the board, um, but understand that some of the plans do take a lot longer, can take a lot longer, and are more involved to um, create than others. Um, the second common issue that we have is often uh, we're unaware of any changes to the contracts that might affect your federal reporting. So for instance, any time extensions or funding extensions um, or project grant number changes, those are important for our office to know so that um, we make sure that re the reports that are going to the sponsor are accurate. And I have familiarized myself as much as possible with ERPM. It's not a system I work in every day. Um, and I'm able to find most information that I need, but it is helpful if if you remember to add the um, research liaison email to any communications that you put in ERPM, uh, and I'll show you that email address in just a moment, um, that way I get a message that lets me know what might be going on with the project, and then I don't have to reach out you know, and interrupt, interrupt your day or anything. Um, the third item is during the federal reporting time, which is April and October annually, um, the sponsor requires that when I submit a report, um, I add a comment as to why the small business spend goals are not being met. Uh, it's very important to review those quarterly reports that I send. They may seem like just another email, but they are important. Um, if you notice that the small business goals are not being met, add a comment back to me. Um, there is a link within that report. Um, that you can let me know what the good faith is, effort is that's going to be made to meet those goals, or where things have fallen through with the project as to why those goals haven't been met. Um, the PIs and the RAs, you guys, you have the, the, the most knowledge about the projects. Um, I see the budget and the budget justification and that is really about all that I see and know of the project. Um, so the research uh, liaison email address is here along with our phone number. Uh, we also have a handout with this information on it. Um, again, um, if you could include that research email, that would be really great on any of those communications. Um, and there's also our website listed here under the diverse, diversity and sustainability section. Um, we have a little bit more information and a handout um, with regard to federal reporting as well as small business plans. So, thank you.
Thank you, Amanda. And now nobody sat there looking at the agenda and said, Kathy, you went off script. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't buzz me, Brian, like you said you were. So I just felt sorry for people sitting up at the front of the room all the time, you know, and I'm like, people are staring at me. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over now to Brian Van Sickle so he can give you the updates from sponsored programs. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brian Van Sickle from the Sponsor Programs Office in the uh, Division of Finance. I'm here today because Deb Talley has taken it upon herself to go on vacation. Not really. She's in D.C. attending Coger, along with some other folks like Daryl Weinert, uh, where they're getting an industry update as much as there may be one these days about what's happening in Washington that might be helpful to us here at the University of Michigan. And the reason I didn't pull out my little hook and pull Kathy off stage is because if you know Kathy and love her as much as I do, you know going off script is just kind of Kathy's forte. <laughs> so I had no other thought than that she had done it intentionally because an agenda is just something for other people to really pay attention to. <laughs> And while I had talked about a buzzer, it was really more of a bleeper because sometimes Kathy has a tendency to be very open in her opinions. So it, we're on, you know, a video recording, and so she is eligible for retirement, or as my prior director used to call that, non-academic tenure. So you can do whatever you want, and the worst that they can say is, hey, see you later. I know she's not really quite ready to retire just yet, because I keep threatening her life as she is to retire before myself, and I'm not eligible for at least three more years. Uh, so I wanted to just take a moment, get the clicker ready to go. Um, we'll talk about a few things. You know, my f always favorite topic is to talk about auditing. But it is job security. It's one of the reasons why I still have my position, so we do have to talk about it. Um, but just reflecting back on the folks who already were here and moved over there, except for Amanda, um, one of the things that I think Kathy and myself, for folks who've been around the university for as many years as we have, um, can appreciate is the degree of collaboration that goes into a lot of our business processes here in 2018 compared to how things used to be back in the days when technology and silos and organizational structures kept that from happening. And while we know that our researchers and faculty are very much encouraged to work collaboratively across departments and across disciplines, um, the same thing can be true for how we handle administrative solutions. Um, for each of the three groups that presented, uh, you know, their jobs are made a lot easier um, and more able to be accomplished by the work that you all do and by our ability to share information with each other. Um, the HSIP solution used, didn't exist Chris, you were there when it started. What year was it? 2013. So it's only five years old. Uh, prior to that, if you were interested in making payments to human subjects, it was a hodgepodge together of solutions from a myriad of different offices across campus. And it was really a groundswell of requests from folks in the research administrator's position saying there's got to be a better way to do this that resulted in finding a solution um, that ended up being, I think, a national standard for how to do it and do it well. Um, the tech transfer folks do an outstanding job with getting things out um, and into production across the country and around the globe. And even the folks in our procurement office um, who, in our finance umbrella, um, they sometimes are questioning, like, how does research administration impact them on their day-to-day -day basis? But there are staff in each of the divisions in finance who are supporting what you all do and who the work that you do supports what they do on an ongoing cycle. And Amanda putting together the plans for the spend in small, minority, women-owned businesses is something that the government and the federal funding agencies are still always quite interested in in the federal contracting space. So kudos to all of them. And transitioning into my official agenda items, update on the single audit. So for those of you who are new, and there were a couple of folks in the audience, um, you may not be aware that the university produces a single audit report that's based on a federal law known as the Single Audit Act. 
Um, it's a mandate for every agency or organization that's in the nonprofit realm that gets more than $750,000 of federal expenditure activity in any given fiscal year. So how many people have read the fiscal year 2017 university financial statement? Raise your hands. Okay, everyone who works in sponsored programs, put your hand down. All right, Melissa Carby, what was our federal expenditure amount for fiscal 2017? Billions, so a little bit lower than billions. We would like to get to billions, but over a billion, so we'll give you close enough credit. You can have two extra cookies for that. Take them home to your husband. They're not German cookies, but they'll have to count. Her, the, I don't know any German, uh, uh, sauerkraut. <laughs> Her husband's a teacher in my kid's school district, so that's why we have a little bit of, um, so it was over a billion dollars, so for those of us who are able to do math, way over the $750,000 threshold. Uh, so the idea when Congress passed this law, as I would like to think is usually the case when Congress takes time to pass a law, was they were trying to make life better. And the intent was that the government would require all of the recipients of their dollars to have one audit done each year to prove that they were taking proper due diligence and care and shepherding the government's assets and ensuring that there was not fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, so our fiscal year 2017 ended last June. Uh, the audit report is due into the federal government by March 31st. Today is February 22nd, and we're almost done. Which every year we're almost done in February, but we always get it submitted on time. Uh, so for those in the audience this year who had a project that was in this year's audit sample, please raise your hands. I know there are a couple of you here. No. Anyway, they are wanting to remain <laughs> anonymous. Uh, so I will be happy to report that for the 15 projects that were picked in this year's audit sample, um, that we've had clear sailing, um, that our audit report at this point only includes two confirmed findings. Uh, one that is related to financial aid, which nobody in this room, I believe, is responsible for. And the second finding is unfortunately about how we handle federal inventory. Um, there'll be another slide about that in just a moment. Uh, the third issue that they are still investigating that was not tied to the 15 projects, but just to overall business process, is about how we do subrecipient monitoring. So that's where we take projects that we have here and then issue awards to partners at other institutions. Uh, so by and large, a clean bill of health this year, which is um, almost always the case for the university. Uh, we do a good job at stewardship. We do a good job with administration and controls at the institution. Uh, but as is always the case, um, improvements can be made. Uh, the second bullet point on this slide is just a heads up. Uh, this coming year, uh, our goal with the auditors is to turn the audit around quicker than in years past, and in order to accomplish that, the fiscal 2018 audit is going to kick off in April. So what the auditors are going to do is they are going to select a sample of projects and then do about 70 to 80 percent of their testing based on the first three quarters of the year's financial activity. And then they will return in July and August and wrap up the audit with the goal of having the single audit report submitted to the regents for approval in October, which is the same month that the main financial statement audit gets submitted, uh, which would be outstanding because that means I could then go for the holiday break and not have to worry about coming in and doing any work on the audit. And so I'll have my fingers crossed on that front. Uh, my segue about the second audit finding for this year is about equipment and inventory management. How many people in the room are involved with, in, or with the inventory process? Some of you I know are, and I can call you out by name. I saw a few hands getting raised. Uh, so this will be the fourth year in a row that our single audit has discovered a finding related to inventory and inventory management. Um, I'm happy to say that only in the first year's finding was there any amount of funding that we needed to return to the government. Um, the other last two years, and in this year's, again, 
it's not a matter of us having to give the government money back. It's a matter that the inventory process hasn't been as comprehensive as it needs to be. A case in point, our biggest issue is that the inventories that get sent back have indicated that items have been disposed of, um, when in reality, when the auditors have asked for more information about the disposals, it has been discovered that, oh no, it really wasn't disposed of, it was just in a closet in the room next door, and no one's been using it, and no one went and looked for it when they filled out the inventory. Uh, so there will be some communications coming from central administration about this. And in addition, for anyone who's involved with the annual um, internal control certification process, um, for this year there will be a new, um, oh, I'm blanking on the word for it, a gap analysis, thank you, um, for inventory. Uh, this year, it's just informative, so it's to get the information out to the schools and colleges and the campuses about what the internal control process will be looking for. And in fiscal year 2019, it will be one of the required certifications. Uh, it's a struggle. Uh, we're a large institution. We have lots of pieces of equipment that are purchased by the federal government. We have some of those pieces of equipment that stay on the inventory rolls for literally decades. Um, some of them because they are still being used decades later. And with turnover and transitions with staff and project teams and researchers, it becomes challenging to keep track of them. Thanks to ITS and to PeopleSoft, um, there are a lot of software solutions that can help with keeping track of those items, and they are looking at even some more IT enhancements to try and make that as less of an onerous activity as possible. Um, for those of you who want to do some pre-reading, though, there is a standard practice guide. Um, I will preface, though, that it is one of the standard practice guides that is getting ready for an update. So you might not want to go, like, right now and read this. You might want to wait a couple weeks. Um, but there will be an updated SPG about equipment and inventory, and it will behoove you if you are involved with that process to make sure that you are familiar with this. Anyone by chance have any questions about inventory that they'd like to throw out there? I'm only looking at my watch because Kathy's a little quick too, so we have 24 minutes to kill between Craig and Kathy Handyside and I. We could dance. We could dance. Trust me, that was my thought. All right, we'll keep that in mind, scary thoughts as it may be. Uh, the last thing for the sponsored programs update is we have some staff changes. Uh, Thankfully, a few less than we sometimes have to bring to you, but new this time, thanks to Constance, is the addition of photographs so these people can no longer hide from you. <laughs> uh, so in my team on the customer service group, um, we had a staff member who left, whose picture is at the bottom here. Is there a laser pointer on this? Okay, whatever. That guy right there. <laughs> Scott Culver, who used to support our folks out in engineering and EECS, um, he got promoted to be a reporting supervisor on our reporting team. And his move to the reporting staff left an opening in customer service. Uh, so we took that opportunity to move some folks around. So Jean Haney, Jean, could you stand up, please? Your picture's not up here. So. <laughs> Jean Haney has previously been helping out with engineering in LSA, and so she's taken over EECS and um, mechanical and civil from Scott. And then Christy Tomaszewski. Christy, go ahead and please stand up, because your picture is also not up here. Christy has replaced Jean in her department, so if you'd like to meet her. And then last but not least, um, Leah Toon, who's been in customer service for a really long time, and then briefly went to the medical school, and then has now rejoined sponsored programs. Leah, where did you go? Stand up, Leah. She has taken over Christie's departments in the health sciences area. Uh, in addition, um, all of that was precipitated by our office creating a new reporting manager role uh, to help Chris Beckin out with the amount of work that she has to take care of with producing thousands of financial reports with her staff every year, plus continuously training all of you at the departments because you keep taking our folks. Uh, so Aaron Campbell, who's here and has his picture so he can stand up and you can see him in person, um, is in that position. And then, as is always the case, in January we had our group of new hires that came on board. 
So there are four new accountants, um, as well as two interns who have made it through their first month of training and are putting together and sending out their first set of financial reports. Um, in addition to that, we also had some of our interns from last year who attempt for us through the fall and who ended up graduating and then being offered a full-time position. So Zach Cranson, where are you? There he is over there. I don't mind making him stand up because Zach is the um, first of our um, legacy hires. So his, Zach's mom works in LSA. So Zach is not allowed to do financial reports for his mom's departments because he'd be really mean to her and disallow all her costs. Uh, what? Oh, Sherry, we're never that mean. We save all that for the med school. <laughs> or an ISR for sure. Uh, but Zach is an example of what happens when uh, your mom goes to a uh, navigate uh, UG beta test class and you have to listen to Brian talk about how we can't find any good people to be interns and then she's like hey my kid's going for an accounting degree maybe you want him to be an intern so if anybody here has anybody in their family kid cousin niece nephew who's going for an accounting degree um, see Aaron when we have the meet and greet time because he's doing hiring right now for our May cohort and would be very interested in getting the names and resumes for those folks. All right, I think that is it for me and I will hand off to Mr. Reynolds from ORSP. Good afternoon, everyone. Try it again. Good afternoon, everyone. That's, you know I like that. It makes me feel I leaned over to Brian and I said, you're going to have to stretch it out for us to stay on time, but I had no idea that you were that good. <laughs> so we're, we're almost back on schedule here, I think. So um, actually, when I was driving over here, I had two thoughts. My, my first thought was, what a beautiful, glorious day with the blue sky. And I haven't seen my sunglasses in six months. So if anyone knows where my sunglasses are, I could have used them today. And the other thing I, I realized, and I, so I'm not, a, I'm not a member of the Jet Set particularly, but I've been around. And yeah. here's what I can tell you, is that I've, I've, I've been to Cuba, I've been to Botswana, I've been to Ghana, and the one thing that they all have in common is they have better roads <laughs> than, than wow. we do. Wow. It's, it's, it's bad out there. So. In any event, uh, to the update for ORSP, I'm delighted to say that we have three new assistant project representatives joining our team to, to help the beloved but beleaguered staff that we already have. Uh, and I believe two of our three new uh, assistant project reps are here. So Caitlin Jost, come on, wave to everybody, Caitlin. And Caitlin is on the private sponsors team uh, and Daniela Marcelletta. Also here, stand all the way up, all the way up. We want people, to, yeah. And the prodigal son, uh, Ray Ronaldo Martel, who used to be in our office as an administrative specialist, and then went out to the uh, to LSA for some some polishing. Uh, he came back, and so I mean that tells you that our ORSP is a pretty good place to work if people are coming back. Yeah. Um, but the guy's on vacation. I, I don't, you know. How does that work? You know, get a new job and go on vacation. But um, so a few policies and procedures updates. So uh, the, the the internal deadline policy. What can I tell you that you don't already know? So uh, it's it's still looking like it's going to be uh, two service levels depending on when the proposal and the path reach ORSP. Uh, a, a much more robust review at four days or a minimal institutional review at two days. Uh, Daryl Weinert and I presented the, the policy to the academic programs group, that's the deans essentially, and there was a widespread understanding uh, that the policy is needed. Uh, much of the conversation focused on the extension policy uh, for one additional day and what the how those extensions will be handled and what's the appropriate uh, amount of time that an extension should be for. So where that stands right now, is that uh, Jack Hu, our Vice President for Research, he is going to be uh, making the final call on, on what the, the policy will look like. 
uh, doing that in consultation with the deans and some of the research associate deans. Um, so some, some high level parts of the policy are still a bit in limbo, but will be ironed out shortly. And then I'm working with a couple of groups, both within ORSP and then a cross campus working group that are talking through some of the implementation details as much as we can, given the fact that some of the specifics of the policy are yet to be ironed out. But uh, with any luck, we're still hoping for a soft launch of September 1st, and we will continue. Uh, you'll certain this will not be the last time you hear about it, but between now and September, so there will be a, a pretty robust communications and, and training push. I'm, sta I'm standing on something. Hold on a second. Oh, it's stuck. It's a Here, so a wire. Let me help a you. wire is glued to my foot. Yes. Oh. Don't step on that. That was intended. Now what is he doing? Goes and steps on it again. That, that was that was intended so I wouldn't trip, but it's doing just the opposite. Uh, so anyway, the soft launch in September, uh, and then a hard launch of July 1st of next year. So that's still on track as far as I can tell. Um, the other another policy and procedures update is related to the post award change request form, PAC R. Um, we updated it um, a couple weeks ago. A new, there's a new version out on the web that allows you to not only have a signature line, but a place where you can enter the name of the person who's actually doing the signing. So we don't just take it on faith that the signature is of someone that we, we know is authorized to, to, to sign the form. Uh, so that's good news. So if you have a local version on your, your desktop, please delete that and go out to our website and get the new form. I'm told that there's really only two good things I've done in this office. One was that uh, I changed the coffee, and, and, the, and the second was this form. Um, the agreement acceptance request, the R. Uh, just a reminder, um, we're, we're still having some growing pains with the AAR, uh, so just a reminder that the AAR is a wholly separate uh, project type in e-research, different than a PATH, in the same way that the, the unfunded agreement is different from the PATH, the AAR is, is its own type of project type within ERPM. So when we route an AAR for approval, the activities need to happen on that AAR. So, you, so uh, an, uh, uh, an approval which takes the form of, let's say, a posted comment to the PATH doesn't help the AAR get through its programmed workflow. So make sure that when you're approving uh, an AAR that you're, you're actually going to that particular project type, the AAR record, and taking your activities there. Uh, there is a step-by-step -step procedure document um, that's on the e-research e training, uh, um, the list of training uh, guide. Um, also, d just so you know that you would, if you have any action that needs to be taken on an AAR, you will get an email notice. The AAR is also available via the PATH itself, the proposal approval form. And then it should also be in your workspace in, in the listing for PATHs with required action. So know that there's three different places that you can actually access the AAR. And you should know too that there are different levels of approval depending on what kind of AAR request that, that, you're, that is being routed, like a publication restriction goes all the way up to Jack Who's office whereas a cost-sharing cha cost change might, uh, will, will have a limited set of reviews. And I know it's a bit confusing, but some, and for many of the AARs, there's actual, uh, uh, actually a step that requires the project team not to actually approve the AAR, but go in and edit it and route it for approval. So these are just some of the growing pains and uh, some of the uh, uh, points that we hope to, to uh, reinforce today so that that process becomes a little bit more smooth for everyone. Um, I want to say a word or two about the award management system uh, that you've heard all about um, but don't know anything about, let me put it that way. Uh, uh, so that work is ongoing, uh, led by Kathy Handyside's ABLE team with lots of other players involved from across campus in central offices as well. Um, I'll skip to the bottom of the slide there. So we still hope to go uh, to implement testing and user acceptance testing in June, so that's not that very far away. In order for us to get to that point, we're focusing on uh, certain different tracks within the award management uh, uh, project. Uh, one is related to the initial award setup. 
another track related to compliance, a track related to modifications of existing awards, the all important data conversion, and then reporting, which is, which is making sure that all of the existing institutional reports that we have um, can be reproduced with the award management system. So we'll be, we'll be doing some, as I said, user acceptance training in, in June, uh, more uh, user acceptance testing in June, training in July, and with, you know, knock wood, go live August tw tw of 2018. So there will be lots more coming on this topic as well. Uh, but this is, I, I saw something that looks almost like what the system will be when it's, when it's rolled out and this morning. And I was just so excited. It's, 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 you're going to love it. It's going to be so great. Um, some policy updates. Uh, for those of you that are involved in human subjects research, where'd you go? Right over here. In the human subjects incentive, HSIP. I, payment? Program. I was, I was paying attention. Um, <laughs> For those of you that are involved in human subjects research, um, the common rule, or is, which is the shorthand for the federal policy for the protection of human subjects, uh, we were expecting uh, that policy to federal policy to be revised, and they actually, they meaning the federal government, delayed the implementation of the common rule to July 19th. Um, so, so many of the changes that we were expecting to happen uh, in June, in, sorry, in January of this year, were actually delayed until. July. Uh, so what that means is um, things are in a bit of a holding pattern. Some of the flexibilities that were granted under the, the proposed revision we're waiting on. A good example being uh, the flexibility we have for self-determination reviews of certain exempt research. That's not, we're not going to be able to implement that change uh, that reduces administrative burden until July 19. Um, continuing review is still going to be required, at least for now, for minimal, for qualifying minimal risk research. And just know that the templates that are available from, from IRB Med and IRB HSBS, use the ones that are on the web. I think that's the shorthand version, and you'll, and you'll be safe. Uh, a reminder, uh, we, we, we just went through the first major uh, NIH deadline with the new Forms E requirement. Um, I'm not going to belabor the point too much here other than to say um, I, we have a video on RSP's YouTube channel. I think we have how many? Five, ten followers? <laughs> we, we have. This increased it. It's going viral. Uh, <laughs> but we, we, do have a, we do have a video that um, with, the, with the great help of, of Constance Colthorpe and, and Colleen Vogler and Neil Carver in my office and, and others. Um, a, a, narr a narrated walkthrough of the form and how that, how that is implemented here at Michigan. So that's worth your time. Remember that the definition of a clinical trial has changed and is much broader than it used to be. So it includes health-related behavioral outcomes. That's the shorthand version of more than just clinical trials as we, as we typically think of it. Requirements for good clinical practice training. You can only apply to do a clinical research under specific FOAs that say that you can do uh, clinical research. There's the new Forms E and PHS Human Subjects and Clinical Trials Information Form itself, which Kathy will speak to a little bit in a moment. Uh, a requirement for single IRBs for multi-site stud studies. This is, again, only NIH. And reporting in NIH, uh, in, in, sorry, in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, I'm not sure if it's, oh, so, yeah, I know another uh, hats off to Chris DeVries and uh, Constance and many, many other people, a uh, crack team that was uh, ad hoc assembled from the Research Administration Advisory Council to put out on our website a, a PDF version of that Form Z in PHS Human Subjects Clinical Trials Information Form that you can use when you're sitting down with your faculty and trying to understand their research. Um, just know that there is a new version of that form out on our web as well. There were some tweaks. So if, again, if you've got a local copy saved to your desktop, make sure that you go out and grab the, the latest version. Shout out to Melissa Carvey and Kathy Leibowitz. Oh, so I've, I've been told. Uh, also a shout out to Melissa Carvey and Kathy Leibowitz. Melissa, you get three cookies. <laughs> um, this is an early uh, heads up because it doesn't really go into effect until January. 25th of 2019, that's a long way away. 
Um, but NIH is, has recently announced a new uh, policy called the Inclusion Across the Lifespan, and essentially uh, there will be a requirement that um, for human subjects research you, you justify um, all of the ages that you might want to include in research, not just children anymore. You've got to actually uh, include a plan describing how participants across the lifespan will be included and why for that range. So. Um, octogenarians and above, why are they included or not, or, you know, pick an age, but the point here is, is, is not just specific to children anymore, but across the lifespan. And this may be finally it, um, just a heads up that it's already in effect, but there's a new uh, PAP guide or the pr pr Proposals and Award Policies and Procedures Guide from, N from NSF, um, and as is their want, they have a very helpful uh, summary of the significant changes, which includes uh, the collaborators and other affiliations uh, s template use, um, a requirement that there actually be a separate section in the project description regarding intellectual merit, and the budget justification can now be up to five pages. I know that it really pleases so many of you that you get to, to write another five pages. So that's all I have. Any, any questions? That's good news for me. Uh, so let me introduce the, um, the Abbott to my Costello, uh, the Thelma to my Louise, the Sunny to my Cher. All right, Kathy Handyside. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Craig and um, Brian. I think you might have stretched just a little too far, so now I got to, um, which is good news because I have a brief update today. Um, so, um, most of the work that my team has been focusing on for the last 12 months has been related to awards. So, thank you, Craig, um, and we hope to be rolling out more information about that to you soon. But the primary topic I wanted to talk to you all about today were the NIH Forms E. Hmm. So let me start. I know that not everybody here or in TV land um, does pre-award, but how many of you had the fortunate opportunity to submit Forms E and the February 5th deadline? My hearts go out to you. Thank you so much. How many of you had to use the Human Subjects in Clinical Trials form? Thank you. I'm sorry. I know it was a pain and it was not our intent, but um, for those of you who do post-award, be grateful that you didn't have to go through this little pain process. So what I just wanted to talk to you about today is kind of the known problems and what we're doing to fix them and um, what, how soon we'll have some fixes in place. So first of all, for those of you who don't know, um, these forms, this form set was applicable to um, proposals being submitted on deadlines on or after January 25th. And that new clinical trial, human subjects and clinical trials form specifically is really a bear. It has a lot of conditional questions. If you say yes to this, then you get a whole bunch of new questions. And um, for both my, our, our vendor, Click Commerce, and the NIH, there were some problems that just appeared as we got close to submission time. Um, the good news is we got everybody's submission in. So that's good news. Um, we do have, um, and we've been communicating via the RAPID and some other mechanisms to, and help testing incidents, to try and help everybody get through this. Um, so we do have um, a list of known issues, some of which were addressed with a fix that we put into ERPM on February the 7th, and we have a fix for some additional issues that we are planning to put in on Monday, February the 26th. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what got fixed on February the 7th. Um, so the items that um, related to the study page. So if you have human subjects and you have a study, there was a problem with the study title, not being able to be longer than 30 characters. There was a problem if you had an age limitation that you couldn't indicate that that was not applicable. And then there was also a display order. You could say, these are the forms and I want them to show up on the other side whenever they get to the sponsor in a certain order. And you could say it, but it didn't do it. So those things have been fixed. We have an additional set of known issues 
um, specifically with a table that you use to list the enrollments um, and some of the specific columns are not adding up correctly. Unfortunately, that requires um, intervention from us in order to fix it before you submit it. And then there's a couple of things that are being truncated in the generated PDF version for whenever you create the view you want to see here, even though we send data to the sponsor, you can generate a PDF version so you can see what your proposal is theoretically going to look like on the other side. And so now I have to tell you late breaking news, and this is thanks to Ms. DeWitt, because you switched the order, I have an update as of 251 today. <laughs> um, see, it was all planned. Um, we actually have somebody who has a submission due tomorrow. They found yet another issue and we didn't have a workaround for it. And because we're all tested and ready to go, we're actually going to implement this fix tomorrow morning because um, they need it for their submission that's due tomorrow. So dee 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 late breaking news. Um, so my slide is wrong. That'll actually go in Friday, February the 23rd? Third. Sorry, I can't remember what day it is. Um, so those fixes will be in place tomorrow morning. So that's good news. Um, I would love to tell you we're done with this form, but I don't think we are. So um, by any, if you have any problems, you guys know, please call the help desk. We will do our best to help get you through it, whatever we need to do, so that you can get your submissions in on time. So are there any questions for me? Is it 3 o'clock? Are we back on track? 3.01. All right. Thanks, everyone. Guess what? I'm back on schedule. You can follow your agenda again. So it's time for a break, networking. We have three tables set up here. One, if you'd like to chat with somebody about small business plans or human subject incentive payments or what OTT does, please feel free to join. But everybody, have a cookie, walk around, talk. I'm looking at it. I have my glasses on and I'm looking at Chris and I'm like, Cindy Shingledecker, IRB, the Behavioral Science Group, and I'm going to butcher, no, Renitra Reynolds, no relationship to Craig Reynolds from IRB Med. Thank you. I know this is a very exciting topic for many of you, and uh, so we're happy to be here. There have, have been a lot of changes in the works in our world for the last uh, year or so. Some of those changes were put on hold the day before they were due to be uh, implemented. Um, so we're going to give you just some very high-level information about um, IRB stuff, and we're going to tag-team it a little bit so you won't get bored with one voice. Um, so our, uh, here are our session topics. We don't have to go through them. Um, the first question, or the first thing is, there could be uh, people here that don't actually know what the IRB is. So the IRB is the Institutional Review Board. Um, it is a, an independent review board that's responsible for protecting the rights of human subjects in research by ensuring that research is conducted ethically and in compliance with federal regulations, other federal and state and local laws or institutional policies. And the other 
important role for the IRBs as we are actually here to support research. There might, may be many researchers that feel that the IRB is here to impede research, but we're really here, here to help. Um, at Michigan, there are actually nine separate IRBs in four separate IRB offices. So the biggest IRB is the IRB Med, that's the Med School IRB, um, and they primarily do research by, uh, conducted by faculty, staff, and trainees of Michigan Me Medican, Medican. <laughs> Medicine. Um, and that uses patients or their records or the facilities of uh, Michigan Medicine. They do all research regulated by the FDA. Um, my IRB is not constituted to do FDA regulated research. And then they also do some research that from other units that requires special expertise from the med school that might involve some physically invasive procedures um, or particular procedures that have been identified as needing that special expertise from the med school. My IRB, the IRB HSBS, is actually the health sciences and behavioral sciences. So we essentially do everything on campus that is not Michigan medicine or doesn't go to the IRB med. So it's all the other 19 schools and colleges. We do everything from music teacher research to uh, psych studies to ISR. So we have a, an immense uh, uh, area of different kinds of projects that come through our office. Um, and then our office, to trade off some of the stuff that IRB Med does for us, we do re exempt research uh, reviews on behalf of IRB Med so we can si sort of share the application wealth amongst the IRBs. Um, you might actually not know that uh, Flint and Dearborn both also have um, their own IRBs, um, they're much smaller. Their IRB office consists of one person at each place, um, and in the case of Dearborn, one person who actually works in my office but spends about 30% of her time on Dearborn-related research activities. Um, and then Flint has, as I said, also has an IRB. Um, Rainitra. Now that Cindy's introduced the idea of the IRB and the different IRBs at uh, Michigan, we want to make a distinction between the IRB and the IRB office. So the IRBs, um, each IRB is made up of at least five members. So those are committee members with expertise to review the research under its jurisdiction. Primarily, the boards are made up of faculty members, but they could include staff and students and other community members. Um, such as we include people that are non-scientists and people from the community and sometimes that one person will say, serve both roles. The IRB offices, however, are supported by the administrative staff of each IRB office. So we manage the um, workflow and the uh, communications between IRB reviewers and investigators and most inv investigator interaction is with IRB staff rather than IRB members. So Cindy and myself, I'm the education coordinator for IRB MAD, are staff members, and then so a lot of times you're working with us or the regulatory teams assigned to the board members and other administrative staff. And then the board members are the, the people that actually review the research and make a determination for approval. So that's an important distinction. Um, next, we're gonna talk about what the IRB members use to judge research protocols to grant approval. And so these are from the regulations and basically there's eight criteria that have to be met in order for approval to be given. And this is important to know beforehand before you submit to the IRB so that you know what we're judging or the IRB is judging before for, to make that determination. So first, any risks of the research proposal have to be minimized. Risks to subjects have to be reasonable in relation to the, any anticipated benefits of the research. So the research team is identifying both the risk of the research and any benefits to either society or to individual participants. Next, they're looking at the selection of subjects to make sure that it's equitable, that the people that you're choosing to enroll in the research is justified by the research aims. Informed consent either has to be sought of subjects or a waiver of consent request has to be justified in the submission. 
if you are required to get informed consent, um, if it's not waived, you, can, you have to have it properly documented with the signature of the subject or a legally authorized representative of that subject, or in some cases you would obtain consent but request a waiver of obtaining that signature. In some cases that's to protect the privacy or um, identity of the subject. Next, you have to have adequate plans in the proposal to monitor, uh, monitor data collection to ensure that the safety of subjects is ongoing. There must be adequate provisions for protection of privacy of the subjects and the confidentiality of the data that you collect about those subjects. And then finally, any additional safeguards for uh, the protection of vulnerable subjects. So if you're including children and prisoners, et cetera, you have to have special protections in the protocol to protect those individuals. So what's most important is that the IRB application and the e-research, the protocol and any other research documents submitted reflect these elements consistently in order for the IRB to document that the criteria has been met. So if the protocol meets all of these, but there's inconsistent information in the other documents, the IRB would not be allowed to grant approval at that time. Um, next, we'll talk about the review paths of, subject, uh, of research. So first, there's full board review. So this is for any research that has more than minimal risk to subjects. This includes most FDA regulated research when you're looking at evaluating drugs and devices, complex projects, and this um, research is reviewed by convened IRB and it usually takes about six to eight weeks for IRB HSFES from the submission time to get to the full board. So when we have that committee of five people or more, those people are uh, convened for full board research. Then we have what's called expedited review, and this is for most minimal, minimal risk research projects. Um, it has to be minimal risk and then meet certain federal criteria to qualify for this expedited review. These research projects would be reviewed by a single IRB member, and from the time of submission, it usually takes about two to four weeks. It's important to note, however, that this is a federal term uh, expedited and is not meant to be a fast review. It just means that a single IRB member is allowed to review the project, and it does not require the full board to convene. And then there is exempt review. This also is minimal risk research, but it, there's a different set of federal criteria that can be met for it to be considered exempt. These are also reviewed by a single IRB mem uh, member, or sometimes a staff member can make a determination that a project is exempt. And these take about one to two weeks um, from start to review for um, the IRB. Um, coming in July, possibly. possibly. <laughs> If, so, Cindy noted that the common rule uh, effective date was delayed until July. So, if that still is the date, there is a provision to allow exempt determinations by investigators. And then finally, there's a, a category of research that would be not regulated. So, this would be, for example, research including de-identified data or biospecimens that are de-identified some QA, QI projects, and some oral histories and journalism projects. And this would be, be because they don't meet the federal definition of human subjects research, and then there could be a determination that the IRB does not need to, be re to review. All right, here's a very popular topic, which is what complements, or what co complicates and not doing these things could complement IRB review. So um, I think Renitra mentioned the most uh, common problem and the biggest problem for you and the IRB staff or your researchers, which is where they submit to us um, an inconsistent, incomplete, or unclear IRB application where there might be missing documents, there's an incomplete description of the research in the IRB application, the consent documents are poorly written, and I would give a plug there that 
Um, all of the IRBs offer informed consent templates for investigators, and if you use those templates, then all the required uh, regulatory elements of informed consent are included in those documents, and so that should make your investigators' lives easier if they use those templates that we offer. Um, one thing that uh, Renitra is going to uh, discuss a little more in a little more detail uh, associated with the new single IRB mandate is that research, uh, collaborative research in general will often take a long time to get through the process. Um, and the reason being um, that um, in the current world, in many cases, if you have collaborators at five different sites and everybody at those sites is doing something that we would call engaged, be engaged in research, which means active interaction with subjects or their identifiable data, then all of those institutions either need to have their project go through IRB review at their, their location or we would enter into um, IRB authorization or reliance agreements. Um, to cover or uh, seed oversight for the research activities at, at the, the, uh, the different sites. And so all of that takes process. The authorization agreement process is, is easier for the investigator but can be very time consuming um, for the IRB staff because it involves in, sometimes a negotiation with the other institution about the terms of that, that agreement and just the differing IRB processing times, if, if there are multiple IRB reviews going on, can mean that that investigator really needs to factor in extra time for their full IRB approval before they can really begin in the full project. Um, international research may be the most challenging because uh, um, that in, in those cases often there is an in-country review necessary and sometimes there is even a government review necessary and we have certainly had people doing international uh, research that where it's taken a year for them to get through the process and so if uh, your investigator tends to do something in collaboration with someone outside the U.S. they really need to plan well in advance uh, as far as being able to roll that project out. And then uh, other things that come into play is if data use agreements or other doc, uh, kinds of agreements are necessary. DOD funded research needs a special administrative review from um, the feds after people get approval here. Uh, studies may need certificates of confidentiality. Projects, federal projects involving prisoners require a federal approval of that research once they get through the IRB process. Um, so one thing that people ask us about is the timing for IRB approval. Whoops. And uh, we typically recommend don't submit at the time that you submit a proposal because it often means you and the IRB th go through work that may not be necessary if the project doesn't get funded. So we recommend that people maybe start getting ready but not submit until just in time. Um, we also have a mechanism called an umbrella approval that we can do to essentially give a, a preliminary approval that would allow for the release of funds while the full IRB application can be completed. Single IRB. <laughs> So there is um, now a requirement, which has been mentioned earlier, for NIH-sponsored research. Um, there's a mandate to have a single IRB for multi-site research. This was effective January 25th of um, this year, and it would apply to all NIH-supported multi-site research that includes all of its domestic sites, but not uh, international sites. And this is not limited to clinical research, so it's any project. Um, funded by the NIH. Um, again, with the common rule um, being updated, the planned effective date for a single IRB mandate for all federally funded research, whether it's NIH or not, would go in effect January 20th of 2020, so in two years. And this would apply to all federally supported multi-site studies and is also not limited to clinical research. 
So with the NIH mandate, you, this was mentioned earlier by Cindy, investigators have to designate the single IRB of record as part of the application. Um, so the single IRB um, may be an external IRB, external to U of M. It could be an accredited commercial IRB or can it be an IRB associated with another academic institution. So when a U of M investigator is the awardee of a multi-site grant, U of M, each of its IRBs will evaluate whether it will act as IRB of record or if it will require seeding out IRB oversight to an external IRB. And the plan is to make this determination on a case-by-case -case uh, basis. So it's important to contact the IRB ahead of time before you submit your grant application if you're requesting or if you would like to request U of M to be the IRB of record so that that conversation can be had about whether or not we will accept. I mean, you do not want to get caught putting U of M on the application when we haven't agreed to that yet so that if you do need to contact an external IRB, you can make those plans. When relying on a single IRB, it's important to also note that there are other regulatory oversight um, that would remain in the house. So what you're seeding now is the IRB oversight, but there are ancillary committee reviews here at U of M that will still need to take place. So you still might be working in e-research to submit for these ancillary committee reviews such as research pharmacy, radiation safety, conflict of interest, if there's a management plan that needs to be developed that would be done uh, internally at U of M. There could be monitoring done at U of M for safety, and then the research teams need to make compliance with educational requirements. So peers and HIPAA training would still apply for uh, investigators here at U of M. new um, uh, wrinkle for NIH projects, which is um, the mechanism of certificate of confidentiality, which is used to protect research data from cons compelled disclosure. As of uh, last, a year ago in December, uh, NIH has now said that for any project that is collecting identifiable and sensitive information as part of the terms and conditions of that um, award, the project has um, an NIH certificate of confidentiality. In the past, the IRB used to tell people who were collecting particularly sensitive information to obtain a COC. So the, the um, key thing to know is that, um, that if you have collaborators or sub-awardees that if we hold that certificate, that, that uh, not uh, producing data under subpoena filters down to those other institutions. And so that's a new way of thinking of the COCs and yet another thing to think about as far as um, uh, working with your collaborators. Um, and if for people that have sensitive data but not NIH funded, there's still an application process that's necessary. There's the uh, link to the COC kiosk. Here's some helpful uh, contact information for the IRBs, and feel free to um, call or email our offices because we are here to help. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to thank Cindy and Rainitra very informative presentation. And for our last bit of, for today, David Mulder is going to come up and talk about professional societies and wonderful programs. Thanks, David. Thank you, Kathy. I'm David Mulder. I am the training manager for ORSP and sponsored programs. Um, so just a few quick updates before we adjourn. Um, the National Council of University Research Administrators, or NCURA, has some upcoming meetings. Um, you might choose to go to Orlando in March for the Financial Research Administration meeting uh, or the pre-award administration annual meeting. But why go to Orlando when you can wait until April and go to Des Moines for the Region <laughs> 4 annual meeting um, or wait until August for the national annual meeting? Um, there is a contact email address here. When um, these slides get posted, you can feel free to um, contact that address for more information. 
Then the National Organization of Research Development Professionals, or NORDIP, also has um, a conference coming up. It's their 10th annual conference, which will be held in Arlington, Virginia. There's also, um, sorry, that's in May, uh, May 7th through 9th, and there's an address there for more information. Jill Jividen isn't here today, is she? I didn't see her, but. Okay, um, Jill uh, from the uh, Michigan, Medi Michigan Medicine, or Medifin, what, what, what did Cindy say? Medikin, um, has her email address here. You can reach her. She is the Great Lakes Region Rep for NORDUP, so feel free to reach out to Jill for additional information on that conference. And then the Society of Research Administrators International, or SRAI, also has meetings coming up. Um, in this case, it is the Michigan Chapter Meeting that's happening on June 29th at Central Michigan University in Mount Pleasant. Um, Ruth Halsey, our very own Ruth Halsey from the Cardiovascular Center, um, who is the current president of the Michigan Chapter, is watching online. Hello, Ruth. Stand up wherever you are out there. <laughs> um, and Ruth's email address is also here, so feel free to contact Ruth. Um, with any questions about SRAI. Um, there is also a call for speakers out on their site, so give that some consideration as well. Uh, once again, those uh, organizations' website addresses. And then finally, a quick update on some Navigate information. Um, everyone should have gotten a, a rapid correspondence from me yesterday letting you know that we have extended the deadlines for a couple of the upcoming classes until this coming Tuesday, the 27th. Um, those applications are for uh, the Fundamentals course, which is a seven-day course starting in March and runs through June. And then we also have the Uniform Guidance Cost Principles class. We actually have two offerings of that class coming up. One is going to be here in Ann Arbor on March 13th. The other is going to be on the Dearborn campus on April 10th. So please do um, be sure to get your applications in for those classes by this coming Tuesday, the 27th. Um, and then also keep your eyes open for additional RAP and rapid information about other upcoming classes, particularly related to um, budgeting courses and additional lunch and learn events. Um, and for more information, you can always visit the Navigate portal or email navigate-research at umich.edu. All right, I'm gonna turn things back over to Becky. we made it through well thank you we just wanted to thank everybody for joining us today um, coming out and navigating the parking that's always fun around here um, we just wanted to remind you guys the video will be up soon on uh, the ORSP website and so you know if you wanted to get some of those um, links or, or email addresses that'll be available there um, we also want to remind you guys the next meeting will be Wednesday May 17th um, so that'll be, we'll have the meeting, and then just after that, we will also have, um, there'll be the UMOR uh, Staff Award celebration. Um, and we will be sending out uh, the survey again, just a reminder, please, we would definitely love feedback, you know, about, about how this meeting is going so we can continue to improve. Um, and thank you. Have a good evening. Bye.